Hi, this is Alex. In this video, I'm going to show you how to paint this still life of apples in a big ceramic bowl. And I'm going to be using oil paint. Now you'll get to see every step of the process, including the initial drawing, blocking in of basic colors, defining light and shadow, and adding final details. Along the way, you'll see my palette and all the colors that I'm mixing. And for the most part, this video will be in real time, but I will also speed some parts up. Uh, to make it a little bit more interesting. And that's what the painting looks like in the end. Alright, let's get started. Uh, I'm going to put out some colors on my palette. I'm using titanium white, cadmium yellow, some uh, yellow ochre, cadmium red, a little alizarin crimson, actually I'm going to use a lot of alizarin crimson, burnt sienna, burnt umber, some chromium green, and finally some ultramarine blue. I'm not using black in this case, for now. Let's start out with a little bit of linseed oil and burnt umber as well as ultramarine blue to make a dark wash that's almost black. I could use black but it tends to be a bit aggressive. I prefer to make my own black that's a bit warmer. I'm painting on canvas today so get ready to hear a lot of scraping sounds of my brush. Before you start, it's good to take a careful look at your subject and then imagine it within the canvas space. You can also take a photo with your phone and crop it to how you'd like to see it in your painting. Before we had cell phones with cameras, I used to take two pieces of cardboard cut into L shapes and create a little frame to look through and find my composition. I actually still do that sometimes, but Using a phone is pretty helpful. Once you have an idea of what you want the painting to look like, it's time to roughly block it in on the canvas. I'm using a fairly big brush and not really getting into a lot of details at this point. Uh, when working on a larger piece, and this is 16 by 20, it's especially important not to get bogged down by details in the very beginning. It may be tempting to try and uh, do a very accurate drawing first and then go into painting and paint all the little areas you've defined almost as if you were doing paint by numbers, but there's a real danger in starting that way. What's going to happen is that you'll be so invested in initial drawing that uh, you worked so hard on that you might adhere to it more than you should. Instead of taking a big brush and blocking in large areas of color, uh, you'll be there with a small brush trying to get the transitions just right and all that. And the result uh, in the end will be a painting that is not cohesive and harmonious but segmented into pretty little areas that don't really coalesce. It's far better, in my opinion, to start loose and stay loose until you have established the important elements of your painting. And those are composition, definition of overall light and dark areas in the painting, definition of light and shadow on the objects, and relationships of overall color in the painting. Once you have those things, the painting will look realistic from far away. And at that point, you can go further into the detail and continue refining until you're happy with it. While you're in this stage of the painting, it's pretty easy to make corrections. In fact, it's better to spend a little bit more time uh, in this stage and really get things right before you move on to color. 
and I don't mean define all the details I mean get the composition and the proportions all right and if you need to erase take a bit of linseed oil or solvent on a rag and just wipe it away Okay, I'm going to speed things up a bit while I work on the sum of the leaves and the stems. And once I'm done with that, I use the same color that I use for the drawing to block in the shadows as well. Because the apples are pretty dark red, the edge between light and shadow might be a little hard to see, but uh, you can uh, definitely see the deep dark spots between the apples, uh, which I'm going to block in. Next, I'm going to bring in some ultramarine blue, a little bit of white, and some more burnt umber to mix a color for the background. You can see that it, it's kind of a cool gray that gets warmer uh, where the light hits the surface. I'm just going to block that uh, in around the apples. And there's probably no need to see uh, that in real time, so I'm just gonna speed things up a bit. One thing that I always struggle with is mixing enough paint at first. I think it stems from being economical with my paints. But for a painting this large and a background that's this expansive, I should have probably used a palette knife and mixed a bigger dab of this color. One nice thing about having to keep remixing the color though is that you do come up with some nice variations and it forces you to keep re-examining the color. You can see that in this case I've added some more alizarin crimson to the mix to give it uh, a bit of a maroon tint. I'm going to put in uh, all the dark areas including the shadow that is cast by the bowl on the background before I begin to transition to the lit part of the background. When you're putting in the background it's good to go a little bit over the edge of your subject. So I'm covering the edge between the apples and the background just a, bit, a little bit with the background color. It's a lot more efficient to do that and then use the the apple color to redefine the edge later than to have the white of the canvas left between the two and uh, have to try to fill in the fill in that gap at a later stage. And as I transition to the light part of the painting, I'll keep adding some white and yellow ochre to brighten and warm up the color. At this stage, things don't have to be perfect. I'll probably go back in later and uh, make the lighted area even brighter. Uh, but for now, that should be good.
Now that we have a background, I'm going to do a rough wash over the apples to give myself a good base to go on. I'm just using some alizarin crimson mixed with linseed oil. And this is now my final color and uh, it will mix with other colors to make it more interesting. I'm dropping in a bit of yellow ochre uh, when the apples are less red but for the most part it's just alizarin crimson. Now that I have a base, I'm going to put in the shadows. I already have burnt umber there, but I'd like those areas to be more rich. So I'm using some alizarin crimson with ultramarine blue to make a nice dark reddish purple. I apologize for the glare here. When I start painting, the canvas is matte and it's hard to anticipate if there will be a glare once I apply the paint. Later on I uh, take a peek at the video and realize that there is a glare and make adjustments to the lighting. But for now just bear with me. I'm just going to go around and hit all the shadows as I see them. At this point it's pretty important not to leave any white around the apples. So even if the color is not exactly right, I'm going to lay down some color everywhere. Now it's time to work on the bowl. Uh, I'm not going to go concern myself with the blue decorations that are on, the, on it just yet. First thing is to lay down the base of light and shadow. The trick is to make the base fairly thin so that later I'll be able to easily go over the color with the blue. I'm mixing the shadow color first which is white, ultramarine blue, burnt umber and some yellow ochre. And I'm just trying to find that balance. Under the lip of the bowl the color is darker so I'm just going to add some of my background color to the mix. Same thing happens at the very bottom and on the far right edge where the form turns away from the light and into that deep shadow. Not much to see here as I fill in the bowl uh, with the base color. There is only a little bit of uh, the bowl that catches light on the top part of the lip and the bottom left side. For my light color I'm just going to use white mixed with some yellow ochre. Right now the bowl looks flat gray kind of overall. What's going to make it look dimensional is properly defining light and shadow. Adding light areas will help but also darkening the dark areas and identifying how the light changes as it travels around the form. I think the bowl is a perfect example of why you shouldn't get hung up on details in the beginning. If I try to paint the blue flowers on the bowl at the same time as the base color, I would not be able to capture the overall play of light and shadow and the bowl would come out looking flat. Once I have a solid foundation, I can focus on the trim. Now 
Now that the bowl is filled in, let's move on to the surface. I'm really fond of this piece of wood. It's actually a piece of driftwood that I found during coastal cleanup day. I went uh, out with my wife and daughter to help clean up the Hudson River water edge in Harlem and came across this little beauty. You'll be sure to see it in a few more of my paintings. The basic color here is light brown with a leaning towards yellow. So I'm using burnt umber, yellow ochre, white, and whatever ultramarine blue was in my background color to find the shadow color of the board. Remember, you always want to paint the dark parts first because it's always easier to use a lighter color to adjust the edge between the light and dark versus the other way around. Now for the light part of the wood, I'll use some of the white with yellow ochre as a starting point. I'll often just uh, come up with something close and before going too far, I'll put it on the canvas and compare it with the other colors already there. That gives me a bit more perspective in how to adjust the color. In this case, it was looking a little too pale, so I'll fatten it up with some more yellow. And once I got the color, I'm going to go ahead and block it in, paying attention to the outline of the drop shadows and how soft the edge is between the areas. The farther away the shadow, uh, the softer the edge will become. The exception is, uh, is sunlight, which is always um, going to be crisp. And because so the sun is so far away, it makes no difference. By the way, uh, the medium that I use is uh, pure refined linseed oil from Grumbacher. I ran out, so I'm going to replenish it with a little bit more in my oil container. There are some deep crevices in the front face of the wood, so I'm going to lay those in with my dark color before I apply the lighter, the lighter shadow color. At this point, I just want to draw them in so I know where they are. Later, I'll fine-tune them. The front face is a little bit darker than the top face. The light is coming from the upper left and in front of the subject. Uh, so the the front face is getting a fair amount of light. Still, it's good to make the definition between the two surfaces clear. Sometimes you'll notice that uh, the very corner between the two planes will have a little bit of a highlight and be much brighter than either of the two planes. This also helps create that definition. Now that I have a base color, I'm going to go back in and redefine the cracks in the wood. I don't want the cracks to uh, distract too much from the subject, so I'm keeping them pretty subtle. They're just there to let you know that the wood is real.
I'd also like to bring a little bit of purple into the shadow of this wood. Uh, purple is a complement to yellow, so I think it will create some nice interest in the wood, which is otherwise a pretty bland color. So it looks like most of the canvas is covered. The only thing left are the leaves. I'm going to start with uh, the shadows, as always, and for that I'm mixing up some chromium green, yellow ochre, burnt umber, ultramarine blue, and just a tad of burnt sienna. That gives me a nice muted dark green. Uh, this isn't the darkest green that, I, that I'll have, uh, just the overall shadow color. I can use the background color to help define the drawing of the leaves. In the initial sketch I just roughed them uh, in very quickly, but now it's good time to take a closer look and really define the shapes and the contours. For the light part of the leaves, I'm going to add some cadmium yellow and white to the existing dark green mix. And then temper it down with some more chromium green and yellow ochre. A lot of times the color that you mix for the light parts of the leaves may not even look green, but more yellow or yellowish white. But in combination with the dark green color of the shadows, uh, together the, they look like green leaves.
there are a couple of spots on the apples that are green and the color is just about the same as the green of the leaves so I'm gonna hit those spots now uh, now that I have this uh, green brush in my hands This is probably my favorite stage of the painting. Everything is covered and has a nice solid base. Basic light and shadow areas are defined. Drawing is there. Now is the time to make things come to life. And the way to do this is with detail. Now that I have uh, done the pre-work, I can enjoy getting into the nitty gritty a little bit. The apples are dark red for the most part, but there are a few places here and there where the sun didn't hit them directly and those spots, uh, they are more yellow and in some cases even green. On this part of the apple there's some orange that I see as well. So I'm going to use some cadmium red and cadmium yellow mixed with uh, what is already there. And if I see the same color pattern on any of the other apples, I'm going to hit those places as well. I want to mix up a nice dark red color to reinforce and redefine some of the shadows of the apples. Now is the time to push those darks back and pull the lights forward. The edges between things become really important 
when you're working on details. Try to identify the relationship between the edges and the rest of the objects. Sometimes there are some hints that you'll find making you realize that your overall color is not quite right. So now I'm mixing up uh, a sort of a light purple to paint a bloom on the apples. That's the purplish white film that apples have when they first come off the tree. If you've uh, never seen it, uh, that's because by the time they, it gets to the supermarket, uh, it's been rubbed off by all the handling. If you've never done it, uh, you owe it to yourself to go apple picking. No apples taste better than uh, the ones that you just pick up from the tree. You can already begin to see how this little bit of purple is making the apples look so real. The best way to go about painting bloom is to just try to copy what you see. Where you see it more opaque, make it more opaque. Uh, where it's rubbed off and uh, more of a dark red of the apple is showing through, leave those parts alone. Slowly the apples will begin to come to focus. You just have to have faith. Generally you'll see it over the dark parts of the apple and not over the green or the yellow parts. I notice uh, there is a little bit of cast shadow visible over the orange part of the apple so I'm going to use the orange that I already have as the base and darken it in a bit to make that shadow. looks like I've run out of ultramarine blue. You wouldn't think that you'd need a lot of blue when painting red apples, but here we are. I always underestimate, but I use a lot of blue to cool colors down and for all the grays. And in this case, I need it for my purple too. So I'm just putting that down where I see it and it makes actually the most effect along the edges where it sits against the dark. It also helps when creating form and making it look three-dimensional. 
look at how much more real that top apple looks compared to the rest of them. All it took was a little bit of purple and that highlight. Now let's do that for the other apples. I'm going to use this opportunity to help define the edges between the apples. Remember how loose they were. This light purple cuts through the red so I can use it to reinforce the drawing quite nicely. Anywhere things are a little loosey-goosey, I'm going to draw that in and make it a little bit more crisp. In some cases the bloom covers most of the apple surface and in some uh, it's just a little bit. I'm just trying to mimic what I'm seeing and what's happening in the subject. This stuff rubs off very easily so as soon as you pick the apple some of it comes off and the pattern uh, which in which it comes off is very man-made. There are fingerprint smudges, scuffs. It's not exactly nature, but the patterns still look really pretty. And sometimes just a little bit of bloom is all it takes to give the apple some gloss and life. It is possible to go overboard so you know I'm just trying to take my time here. This apple needs a little bit more definition. And as I work on the apples, I'm adding some highlights to see how they feel. On that back apple, there is a nice cast shadow from the middle apple, and I'd like to clarify that a little bit. The apple is already pretty dark overall, so I'm going to use the light orange color to indicate the light and let the existing color serve as the shadow color. That same uh, orange color is on the middle apple as well, so I'm just redefining the edge and reinforcing the highlight a little bit. The two apples in the foreground have their ends pointing forward, so that part is darker overall, but there's still a little bit of orange showing through the dark red. It's just a lot darker than on the sides uh, or the stem end. Of course the same rules of light and shadow apply even when you're painting something that has a varied pattern. Surfaces that are facing the light need to be lighter and those facing away get darker. It's just a lot harder to keep track when the surface color is changing. But on the apple's ends it's really important to define that. There's also a little bit of purple coming into play, which sometimes can confuse things a little bit.
but as long as you keep in mind where the dark is going to be and where the light is going to be, you should be okay. And there's a little bit of a highlight happening at the point closest to us on the right apple. On the left one it's a little different because it's turned to the right more. Since my brush has white on it I'm going to hit the highlights on the left apple too. Okay, let's get back to the two front apples. I'm gonna get some more dark shadow color and try to clarify the shadow of the tip of the left apple. Because it's turned to the right more, there is a really nice shadow being cast inside there. Now I'd like to capture a little bit of the reflected light inside that shadow. And for that I'm using uh, a purple that's similar to the bloom color but darker. It still has to come across as a shadow so I can't go too bright. There is some of the same reflected light on the right apple as well. A little bit inside the tip and also on the right side where the white plate reflects the light up into the surface of the apple. To make the reflected light work harder for you the deep dark shadows should be pushed all the way back and that makes those reflected lights kind of come forward more. And there are some places where the bloom has rubbed off completely and the dark red of the apple that's showing through is darker than the base color that I have applied. Uh, in those areas I'm going to apply some darker tone and I'm just using some alizarin crimson and burnt umber a little bit of ultramarine blue for that. As I'm adjusting the contrast, I'm also going around and refining the edges as well. Now is the time to pay attention to the contours and what happens when the apples meet the background color. There is a little bit of yellow reflected off of the middle apple into this one that I'd like to capture. Reflected light is never as bright as the source and once you start noticing the reflected light you see it in all the th apples. So let's go around and apply that everywhere. There are four basic areas that you need to capture on any object to make it look dimensional. Light, where the light hits the object directly. Shadow, where there is no direct light. The highlight, which uh, will be at a 90 degree angle to the light source. Reflected light and the cast shadow. There are subtle variations within each of those areas, but if you can capture those main ones, your object will look pretty real. Let's not neglect this apple that's outside the bowl either. I want all the apples that are in the foreground to have a similar level of finish. The ones in the back that are barely visible don't need to have uh, much detail. 
Uh, what I don't want to do is to make this one apple that's outside be more detailed and refined than the others because that'll kind of throw things out of balance a little bit. So I'm just giving it the same treatment. You want your painting to have to be a cohesive little world. If you make one thing more detailed, your viewers will land on that object and not move on to other parts of the painting. And that makes for a very stagnant experience. You want your paintings to feel fluid and alive, so give the eye lots of places to go and explore. I've uh, just been defining the areas that I mentioned before. Light, shadow, reflected light, cast shadow, and the highlight. It's especially easy to see all four of those basic elements on this one apple that's outside the bowl because it's kind of isolated. And uh, I can use the, the background color, in this case the table, uh, to help refine the outline of the apple. I don't worry too much about exact outlines in the beginning and uh, just find where things fall. Now is a good time to refine those little bits. You see how I'm holding uh, five or six brushes in one hand? I use a different brush for each of the different colors. This way I can go between colors quickly without having to wash the brushes in between. The more brushes you have, the easier it is to work in oil. I also never really wash the brushes while I'm painting. I don't like uh, to have an open container of mineral spirits because of the fumes. So if I need to clean a brush, all I do is dip it in linseed oil and wipe it off. This gets it clean enough to um, for adjacent colors and if I need to be even cleaner I dip it again and wipe it a couple more times. Okay I think you get the idea here. Let's speed things up a bit as I finish up the apples. Not really doing anything new here, just refining the edges and adding a few more details. Pretty straightforward stuff. Some of the highlights are a little too, uh, too bright, so I'm softening those and adding highlights where there weren't some. That tip of the apple has the the part where the flower used to be, so there's a little bit more detail there as well. And it can actually appear kind of green. A little bit more details on the leaves. Okay, so now let's get to the bowl. Now it has a pattern of blue flowers on it, which I'll get to, but first I need to refine the overall light, shadow, and color of the white body. If I don't do that first and start painting on the little blue flowers, uh, it'll be a real pain to try to adjust the color or tone in between the little flowers later on. I 
I can see that the rim of the bowl is pretty bright, much brighter than the top plane. And then right under it there is a pretty dark shadow where the rim of the bowl is facing completely down. So I want to separate those areas nicely. And the lip gets darker as it turns away from the light on the right side of the bowl. As I'm starting to work on the bowl, I'm beginning to notice the places where the apples meet the white of the bowl. And in certain spots, I need to adjust the edge. Sometimes it's better to overpaint the edge with one color and then use the other color to create a solid, definite edge. So that's what I'm doing here. Now that I have that overpaint, I can use the white and make a clear edge between the bowl and the apples. I'm noticing now that the white goes up a bit too high uh, in the corner. So I need to use the background color to bring that down. This is why it's handy to have a brush for every one of your main colors. You can just grab it and make adjustments when you see them. As the edge of the bowl turns away from you and goes into the shadow, it almost begins to blend with the background color. So you don't need a very hard edge there, just an indication of where it's going. It's a little different on the light side where the edge should be harder and more pronounced because of the contrast between the background and the foreground. So the initial color that I used to block in the bowl feels a bit cold now. So I'm going to warm it up a little bit. There is a lot of warmth in that reflected light off the wood. So I'm just bringing a little bit of that in. You can kind of see how it looks unnaturally blue overall. I'm also noticing that where the light begins to fall off, it begins to develop a much softer edge between the light and the shadow, so I'm going to blend that edge a little bit more. All I want to do at this point is focus on the overall shape and shading of the bowl and ignore the decorations. Once I have the forms down, the flower pattern will go over that.
a little bit more warmth using some burnt sienna mixed into that color on the far edge and it also needs to get a little darker as it goes away from the light I'm using kind of a purple for that shadow color under the lip and actually using a little bit of that purple helps to balance things out with the apples kind of make those two objects feel a little bit more related Okay, the foliage on the apple outside the bowl is bothering me a little bit. Let me define the stem just a little bit before I move on. Sometimes you can't help but bounce around a little bit. And that's fine. When something bothers you, go ahead and fix it. okay that's looking better the color of the stem isn't quite right but at least uh, we have some indications of what's going on with the stem now let's get started on the flower pattern of the bowl I'm gonna pick up some ultramarine blue with a little bit of titanium white and a lot of linseed oil to make the, make the paint flow nicely that will allow me to draw right over the white of the bowl that's already there without picking up too much of the color. I'm adding a little bit of alizarin crimson into the blue as well to kind of give it a, a slightly purplish tint. So I gotta plan things a little bit. I have to be pretty careful to get the pattern in the right place because if I make a mistake correcting it uh, will be a real pain. But it really does not have to be perfect because the form of the bowl is pretty strong underneath. The pattern will look like it's sitting on it. and It will sitting on a solid surface. You know, it's funny, I've had this bowl for a long time and I've seen it full of fruit on our dining room table numerous times, but I've never really noticed the pattern until now. It's interesting how painting and drawing makes you really look so much closer at your world around you than you otherwise would. I'm using a lighter blue for the pattern that's hit by direct light. For the flowers in the shadow I'm using a slightly darker color. There doesn't need to be uh, that much of a difference because the contrast between the blue of the pattern and the white of the bowl is so strong. Okay, let's speed things up a bit as I draw the rest of the pattern. Nothing fancy here, just trying to copy what I see on the bowl.
Okay, that's looking pretty good. There are certain limitations when painting Alla Prima. If I was painting this using glazing, I would wait for the underlayer to fully dry before painting the pattern on. Uh, then I'd have a lot more control and uh, the ability to erase and correct any mistakes. But I think uh, there's a certain kind of freshness when painting wet on wet and it's uh, worth the loss of control. Let's give a little bit more attention to the stems of the apples and the leaves. Now that we have some thin lines uh, on the pattern of the bowl, the stems are beginning to feel a little unfinished because they're so amorphous. Uh, all I'm doing is uh, finding some highlights and hitting them with uh, some yellow green and in some cases a little bit of brown. If you dilute the paint with some linseed oil or turpentine, you can pretty much draw with it like pen and ink. It will uh, stick really nicely to the paint that's already there without picking up too much of what's underneath. And as soon as you start to lose the color, just go back and reload the brush. I'm also taking this opportunity to define some uh, of the leaf edges that are hit by direct light. Uh, your whole leaf can be a blob, but if you have a sharp edge to it, the eye will uh, fill in the rest of the detail and justify it. See how those leaves back there? are beginning to come into focus as soon as I just give them a little edge. It doesn't take a whole lot. Try to see how the light changes as it travels across the surface of the leaf. In the beginning it's okay to just use one color and define the light parts, but now it's good to see which parts are brighter and which begin to drop off. And those little variations make the leaves look more dimensional and more real. The leaf on the left of the cluster is mostly in shadow, but there's a small uh, bottom edge that is turned to the light. If I put that in, uh, it really makes that one pop.
I want to touch up the apples a little bit. Nothing major, just little touch-ups here and there. In some places the shadows could be a little bit stronger. In others the, the light needs to be more solid. So I'm just going to do that real quick. Okay, now let's give some attention to the surface. Uh, this is actually a piece of driftwood that I picked up while uh, uh, volunteering with my family on Coastal Cleanup Day uh, by the Hudson River in Harlem. It has some really nice, beautiful cracks and gouges in it that I want to try to capture. There's nothing all that different about painting a piece of wood like this than anything else. You need to establish light, shadow, any cast shadows, and any highlight them back even further. This piece of wood has a lot of detail and I'm not planning to capture all of it. So as I'm looking at it, I'm making some decisions as to what to include and what to omit. I'm trying to get the impression of the wood, but not necessarily copy all the details. There's a big gouge in the middle left area that I have to capture. And aside from that, there are some nice cracks running down the edge. As far as the tops of the surface, uh, because I'm seeing it from a much sharper angle, I'm not seeing much cracks and variations in the surface because I'm not really looking into them. I'm going to bring a little bit of purple into the shadows. And the reason I want to do that is to create a bit more harmony in the painting. Uh, the purple and red of the apples is so strong that if you don't have something um, of a similar color in other places uh, in the painting, it might feel a bit segmented. Uh, this way there's a little bit of uh, glimpses of the same color throughout the painting and that sort of makes it easier for the eye to move around the painting harmoniously. A lot of times when people start out painting uh, they will see a red apple and they'll just paint it red. Then there might be a green apple and so they'll paint it green. And then they'll fill, fill in the background, you know, maybe purple brown or something. Well, if all they do is uh, fill those colors in, it'll look like a bunch of stickers on a canvas. If you look closely at the subject, you'll see that the green apple is reflected in the red apple and vice versa. Uh, you'll also see that the brown is reflected in both apples. And the color of the apples is getting balanced off around into the brown of the wood. By mixing all those colors into each other a little bit, things begin to look real and less like a graphic poster. I mean, if uh, that's what you're after, that's fine. Some people are perfectly happy with a graphic look like that. But if, um, you know, it has to be a conscious decision. And I assume that the reason you're watching this video is to learn how to make things look real. So let's focus on that. Okay, so you'll notice uh, on the wood where there are really deep cracks. There isn't just a dark crevice but there's also a highlight that forms on the lower edge of the crack. If we outline the bottom of the crack with lighter color, we begin to get some dimension here. Because this wood is really old, it has a lot of variation across the surface. 
some places are more saturated and some are more faded and I'm trying to capture some of those nuances here I'm going to switch to a bigger brush now and reinforce some of the general areas of light and dark all the little brush strokes of color have muddled up uh, the overall form a little bit. I need to maintain the overall impression of where the light hits and how it tapers off. You kind of notice that it gets a little bit darker overall as it moves to the right. I went a little bit too far in the cast of shadow, so I need to go back and reestablish uh, the edge. And while I'm at it, uh, I'll throw some of the purple into the cast shadow on the left. I'm switching to a smaller sable brush to get into the actual cracks of the wood and put those in. I'm using a pretty dark version of burnt umber and ultramarine blue mixture. As long as I put those cracks into the existing shadow area, uh, I don't have to worry about them being exactly as they appear in real life. If I draw a crack right in the middle of a light area, I'll need to find ways to soften the edges and add some depth around it. Sometimes uh, you can just go over the edge with the same brush uh, and blend it in a little bit or just rub it with your finger. This uh, dark color has a lot of power to focus things and it should be used sparingly in the light areas. Just a touch here and there. As they say, a little dab will do. Now I'm going to use the same thin brush, but this time I'll use it to paint in the highlights along the bottom of the cracks. And the contrast between the dark and the light really helps to make those cracks look real. See how they begin to pop? The corner of the wood where it goes from horizontal to vertical uh, is not a hard edge, but there is a bevel 
uh, there and it's worn off so there's a highlight there that forms along the edge uh, that's brighter than either the top surface or the uh, or the front facing edge as I'm putting these highlights in I'm just trying to make sure that nothing really jumps out at you too much as soon as you begin to feel like something's out of place uh, all you gotta do is just soften the edges a little bit and usually things begin to feel better and I'm just gonna refine a little bit of that edge between the light and shadow this is a pretty useful brush towards the end of the painting when I'm refining the detail I went up washing it out um, and using it for different colors a lot. I should probably get a few more of these to make it easier. Uh, I need to solidify some of the blue flowers in the shadow of the bowl so I'm using a pretty dark version of the ultramarine blue mixture uh, in white. At this point, the painting is about as finished as I want it to be. Of course, I could continue to refine and refine and make things look more and more realistic, but I like to stop when things are still a little bit loose. If some of the colors are off, I might go ahead and correct them, but I don't want to overwork the painting. I guess that <coughs> brings us to a bigger question of when is a painting really finished? And the answer to that question is really personal. For me, I want to be able to look at it um, from about an arm's length away and feel like there is a good balance around the canvas in terms of colors and values. Uh, if something is catching my eye and uh, getting me hung up, I try to fix it. The other thing I want uh, to have is uh, to have most of the edges refined to a certain degree. For example, if you look at this uh, apple here, um, that edge is very loose and undefined. If this apple was in the front, I don't want to fix that. However, since it's in the back, it's not that necessary. The other thing I look for is how finished uh, the surfaces are. Generally, I don't like to leave any of the canvas showing through. There are some exceptions like uh, when the air is very light uh, then some of the white canvas can show through and not be distracting but generally I'd like to cover everything and have control over the values. Okay, if you've made it this far into the video I commend you. It's one thing when you're painting time tends to slip away and you kind of go into a sort of a trance but when you're watching it takes a lot more patience not to skip ahead and see how things turned out so did you skip ahead let me know in the comments also let me know if you like this format did you find the commentary helpful would you like to see more videos like this or do you prefer the sped up versions where you see things happen more quickly this format takes a considerable amount more time and effort, so it would be nice to hear if it's worth it. These longer videos uh, tend to get fewer views, but that's not necessarily how I judge their success. I feel that if I've helped a handful of people, it's more of a success than if I entertained a few thousand. Anyway, let me know 
Don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. Um, and also if you'd like to see what I'm working on right now, I invite you to follow me on Instagram at LXNYC where I tend to post work more promptly. Okay, thanks for watching.